A reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For he that will save his life shall lose it, and he that shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his own soul? Or what exchange shall a man give for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then will he render to every man according to his works. Dignare me la darete quella sacrata, da mi chi vi è tutta in conta ostes tuos. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Reverend Father Prior, dear brothers, dear sisters, dear people, I have nothing to do here. I am come by God's will, and demand that I be sent back to God from whom I came. These words of Jeanne, added to her judges during her trial on February 24, 1431, in one of her characteristically spirited moments, sums up not only her life, but also her sanctity. 489 years later, that sanctity was solemnly pronounced by the highest infallible authority of the Roman Catholic Church. And it was on this day, today, 100 years ago, that in the presence of 43 cardinals, 350 bishops, 600 French priests, 80 dignitaries, senators and deputies of state, 140 descendants of her family, and an innumerable throng of faithful that Pope Benedict XV declared for the honour of the Holy and Indivisible Trinity, for the exaltation of the Catholic faith and the Christian religion, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, having deliberated and implored divine help, we proclaim that the Blessed Joan of Arc is a saint. What does it take to be declared a saint? Well, Gary Gulagrange tells us the procurator of the cause has to prove that the individual practiced every virtue to a heroic degree. And he quotes St. Thomas Aquinas, who says, Common virtue perfects one in a human man. Heroic virtue gives one a superhuman perfection. When a courageous man fears when he should fear, it's a virtue. For if he did not fear, it would be temerity. But if he no longer fears anything because he relies on the help of God, then it is a superhuman or divine virtue. And it's these heroic virtues that are spoken of in the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when they shall revile you and persecute you and speak all that is evil against you untruly for my sake. Certainly what St. Joan of Arc went through. It was on the anniversary of her birthday January 6, 1904, 
that Pope St. Pius X declared the heroicity of the practice of the virtues of theological, cardinal, and connected virtues in her life. And it's thanks to the most concerted efforts of the enemies of God who tried their hardest to prove Jean was a fake and a sinner and a heretic and a witch. It was by this that they, in fact, those men initiated the investigation into the heroicity of her virtues, unwittingly. Let's look at some of those virtues in her own words. Faith. Nicolas Midi said to her, If you don't want to submit to the Church and obey her, we will abandon you like a Saracen. To which she said, I am a good Christian, duly baptized, and I will die a good Christian. What else was her life but a life of faith? From her very youngest days, holding all that is sacred, sacredly. When she received her revelations from God, believing them, Blessed art thou that hast believed. And she held to that belief till her dying breath, when she pronounced on the pile that God has not deceived her. Hope. Article 57 of her condemnation claimed that after the failed siege of Paris, she said that Jesus failed in his promise. We know that hope, as a theological virtue, is to believe <coughs> that God will fulfill that which he promises. And so here they claim, you said Jesus failed in his promise. That Jesus failed me, I deny! She never said such a thing. She never would. Many times during her trial, she would say, I commend myself to God. What else does that mean? Except that she expected, she hoped for, help, support, justification from God. What else was her life but a long act of hope? After it had been revealed to her that she would save France and how she would do it, she not only believed it, she hoped. She hoped that God would fulfill His promise all the way to the end, against all odds, insurmountable, incredible odds. That was the virtue of hope. Charity. The master of theology, Jean de Chatillon. So, Joan, do you accept to be corrected then in a man, according to the decision of these wise men? I commend myself to God, my Creator. I love Him with all my heart. I have always obeyed the commandments of God. Our law is first served. Isn't that a striking contradiction of that other phrase, non servia? I would rather die than do that which I knew to be a sin or against the will of God. Our Lord said, He who loves me keeps my commandments. One of her closest companion in arms, Jean de Metz, stated, I was inflamed by her words 
and her love of God. What else was it like but one long act of love? There is no other way to explain it. It's a mystery of charity. And the daughter of charity is mercy, compassion. Her page, Louis de Court, testifies. Once, when a French soldier was leading some English prisoners, he struck one of them on the head and left him for dead. Joan, seeing this, dismounted her horse, made the Englishman confess his sin, and supporting his head, consoled him with all her power. I say to thee, love thy enemies. Do good to them that hurt you. Bless them that curse you. The cardinal virtues, prudence, when I was thirteen, she says, there came to me a voice from God, teaching me how I was to behave and what I was to do. Recta ratio agibilium. What else is prudence? They told me to be a good girl, to go to church, and to save France. The bailiff at her trial, Jean Massieu, he testified. She was very simple, very smart, and prudent in her replies. Another one of them, Nicolas de Hauteville, said, It would have been impossible for her to defend herself against such an assembly of learned men without the help of him. Prudence in her as St. Thomas says, was superhuman and divine. Indeed, the, even down to the things of war, the commander said, this was a girl, and she was like a girl in everything. But when it came to leading an army and battle strategy, she had the prudence of a general of 30 years of experience. Justice, when Bishop Cochon warned her not to try and escape, she retorted, I made no such promise. If I should escape, no one can accuse me of having broken my pledge. These shackles are unjust. Has it been revealed to you then that you should escape? That has nothing to do with your trial. Do you expect me to say something against myself? We know that justice is to give to another what is his due. Once a prisoner was taken, Ponke Dallas, and he was brought before the Soldiers, and they presented the case to Joan. Should he be executed? She said, Yes, if he deserves it. Give him what is his due. What else was her life but one long practice of justice? The cause of the French, difficult to see. Confusing even for the elite, intelligentsia of Paris. She knew that the cause was just. And that justice went down to every detail of her life. The daughter of justice, as we know, is religion, piety. If we can attend Mass, she said, that would be good. Her friends, they used to make fun of her. 
Because when the bell rang for the angels in the uh, out in the fields, she would kneel down. She would go in the procession to Belmont every Saturday with candles. She was too pious, they said. Often at church, attended Mass with great devotion. Fortitude. Master Vopel says, Joan, have you heard your voices since last Saturday? Yes. And what did they tell you? They told me to answer you boldly, that God will help me. My voice has told me to take all with a good heart, not to be worried about my martyrdom, that I will eventually enter the kingdom of heaven. You believe you will enter the kingdom of heaven? I believe it! as firmly as I see you before me. If one virtue really shines in St. Joan of Arc, it has to be fortitude. She was a soldier. She led armies in the most dangerous possible circumstances. The fear of losing one's life, says St. Thomas, is the highest fear. And yet, in the heat of battle, even in the first battle, the attack on Etourelle, she testified, I was the first to put the ladder against the wall. And Gobert Thibault says, it was this kind of example of bravery which gave her the right to tell the king and the soldiers, go boldly forward. In Compiègne, her last assault to her soldiers who urged her to retreat when they saw that things were not going well. She retorted, Be quiet! Think of nothing else than striking them. And her action on that day was so impressive that it earned praise even from a Burgundian, her enemy. If you can believe one thing, it's the praise of your enemy. When she was staying with the lady, Madame de la Tourelle, in Bourges, she told Joan, you know what the people are saying? They're saying, well, you're brave because you know you're not going to die out there in the battle. And she replied, I'm no surer of that than any other soldiers. No, she didn't have that assurance. Every act in battle was an act of fortitude. Temperance. She called herself La Pucelle, the maid. That means the virgin. Because she tells us, when I was 13, I took a vow of maintaining my virginity for as long as it should please God. Her page, Louis de Coup, said that when she was in the, in the fields on campaign, she would always sleep fully clothed. And the soldiers who were with her, day and night, they said that her presence inspired not lust, but rather a great reverence and a holy purity in them. She made them better, just by being who she was, by living this virtue. And the day before she was to be burned, she was lamenting how her body, which she had kept undefiled, would thus come to its end in action. Indeed, when she was in prison 
on the coast of the English Channel. There was allegedly presented to her a friend, a fellow countryman. And they would talk. And when he tried to touch her, she thrust him away with such power that he was surprised. And to which he testified. Indeed, St. John of Arc's chastity was the reason for what we can call her martyrdom. To die a martyr, it is to die for faith or for a virtue. And the reason why she was condemned was because she resumed her male attire. Why? To preserve her from the advances of the soldiers. And she knew it. And they knew it. That's why they did it. Temperance also includes abstentiousness. The page said that she was. Often he said all she would eat in the whole day was a few slices of bread. In fact, after her great victory conquering the siege of Orléans, all she ate was four or five slices of bread dipped in a little bit of diluted wine. Humility, we know, is a daughter of temperance. Without the grace of God, I would not know anything. When rosaries were brought to her to touch, she said, you touch them, your touch is just as good as mine. Of course, if we really want to go into depth of all of the virtues that effectively served for canonization. We've seen it. It's a volume about that long. And we could spend all day. But that's just a few. But those virtues practiced to a heroic, superhuman degree, that's what made her a saint. And that's what will make us saints. And her sanctity was so obvious that after she was burned to death, one of the executioners said, We are damned men, because we have burned a saint. If he could say that, anyone can say that. A learned author has said that St. John of Arc is the saint which has resembled most of all our Lord Jesus Christ, the model of sanctity. He was her strength. He was her life. He was her last thought. He was the word, her last word, Jesus. Amen.